So on that note, I'm very excited to host this event tonight because as many of you here, um, I've been following the work of Michael for a long, long time and I've been mesmerized by his storytelling but also by his artistry. So it's an absolute treat to welcome him to our library tonight. So a quick show of hands, who has been to this room before? All of you, wow. Okay, I don't need to tell you anything anymore. Um, who um, has seen Michael before or has seen his work before? Okay, half of you, it's great. So a couple of housekeeping notes for the one or two people who didn't raise your hands. Uh, the bathrooms are located right outside this door. Uh, just go to the right and right in front of you. Um, please take a moment right now to silence your cell phones. Uh, you don't need to turn them off. In fact, I encourage you to keep them on, pull them out, take pictures, videos, TikTok, Instagram, whatever app you like using. Tell the world that you're a very cool library event. Get more people to come to the library for events. Um, so yes, please use your phones. Just make sure they're not making any noise. Um, the other thing is that our friends from Upstart and Crow are here selling books over there. Um, it's a wonderful bookstore in Granville Island in Railsper Alley. If you haven't visited them, highly recommend you go there. So you can get uh, copies. Michael already signed all of the copies, so you don't need to wait for a signing. There won't be a signing. You can just grab a signed copy for yourselves. So highly recommend you could do that. So hello, welcome. So I'm going to introduce the speakers, um, and then we're going to get started. Actually, I'm only introducing Margaret, because Margaret's going to introduce Michael. So Margaret is the host of North by Northwest BC, Margaret Gallagher. Uh, we, yes. <laughs> Fans. And that show is BC's highest rated weekend show. And she's been on the CBC radio for 20 years and has won multiple awards, including a Jack, Jack Webster Award and three prestigious National RTDNA Dave Rogers Awards. So please join me in welcoming both Michael and Margaret on stage. She's Margaret. <laughs> thank you, Jorge, and thank you, everybody, for being here tonight. It's such a pleasure to be here and to have a chance to speak with the amazing Michael Nicol Yagalanis, who I have spoken to before, but I always feel like our conversations are too short, so we get to have a long one tonight, which is exciting, I think, for you. Yeah, we should probably tell, because some people are saying they liked our conversation that we had on Sunday morning. Oh, yes. And I had to tell them that it actually was a rebroadcast. From May, it's From true. May. It was May. We had, we okay, had a May good. book came out. It is hard to encapsulate, Michael, the incredible work, the scope of the work done by Michael Nicol Yagalanis. He's a visual artist, he's a sculptor, a storyteller, he was raised on Haida Gwaii, and uh, Michael is the descendant of iconic artists Isabella Edenshaw, Charles Edenshaw, and Dolores Churchill. And you may have seen his striking public artworks uh, on, at UBC and on the streets of Kamloops in Vancouver. And Michael, I have to say that I always think of you when I stop at the corner of 33rd and Knight where your work Abundance Fenced is. And uh, I remember you telling me that in the rain, this is a fence. How many of you have seen that fence? And it looks like salmon. And you told me that in the rain, the street lights shine on it, uh, red and green, mm -hmm. and change like the salmon. Yeah, so it's good to go there just in the evening, actually, because then you can see how the green light on, on a sockeye salmon going upstream is quite green. And then, of course, as they get farther upstream, they start becoming red. And so you can watch the transition from the red go to the, to the amber and then to the red. Yeah, and it, it's like so much of your work, Michael. I, I think it transcends boundaries and it also um, makes you think on so many different levels. And of course, we are all here because of Michael's incredible work, known for his Haida manga style. The books are over there, as we mentioned. Uh, that's generated two bestsellers, probably three now, I'm guessing, with Jaj at this point. Uh, Red and The Flight of the Hummingbird, and the last of which was turned into an opera. Uh, the newest novel here is Jaj, published by Douglas and McIntyre, and that's, of course, what brings us here today. It is such a, such a powerful work. It's so unique. Uh, it blends colonial history with Michael's own family uh, history, and it, again, it's a pleasure to be here with you, Michael. Please give a warm welcome to Michael. Michael Thank you. Thank you. So, Michael, for people who haven't read the book, or who have and need a reminder, who is Jaj? Well, just before, I just had a thought that I just want to insert here. Because the interview that you might have heard on Sunday was taped in May, I'm just wondering if some of the questions you ask tonight 
may end up with a different answer because of my memory. That's so perfectly be, good. And, be forewarned. And I may ask you different questions, too. Okay, good. That's safer. <laughs> but I think it's good to start with Zsaj. Okay. Yeah. So Zsaj is, a, is a Johann Adrian Jacobson, and it's also a Hindi word for discernment, you know, as a precursor to judgment. Um, Jacobson was a, a, a trained captain from Norway who grew up in a very small town like I did, on a small island like I did, from a fishing family like I did, moved to Berlin to seek a broader horizon or, or new things, and I, I did the same to Vancouver. So as we're doing the research, I'm starting to see these parallels and these similarities with this fellow. I'm starting to develop a lot of sympathy. He goes to work for uh, New Germany, because Germany was, what, 1872 was when it became a, a nation state. And uh, they wanted, they aspired to build the sort of same empire that the Americans and the British had. So they were going to build a huge institution and make a great collection. They didn't have anybody who could collect until Jacobson came along, you know, the, the captain, the mariner, a, a very tough, robust fellow he was. And he came over to Canada in 1881, 1882, came up to many places along the coast, including to Masset briefly. And um, all the promises that were made to him about a career path, return to Berlin, be a hero, we'll give you a steady job, raise your family, all's good. None of that happened. Mm -hmm. They paid him for his work, but when he went back, there was no, no, no career for him. And in part, that was because uh, people like Franz Boas, when you know, m many of us may know him as the, the sort of father of modern anthropology, he said, why are we gonna give a job to this guy? He's uneducated, he doesn't even know how to take notes. And of course, we wouldn't expect that from a, a person from a small fishing village in mm -hmm. Norway. But he did create or gather probably one of the most impressive collections on the planet of, of cultural objects from this part of the world. I think there's 13 or 16,000 pieces of work. And uh, you know, over the course of the conversation, we'll talk about the different ways of acquiring objects. Mm -hmm. And I just want to say at this point, there isn't one size fits all. Yeah. How did you first become interested in his story, Michael? Well, you know, there's that, um, someone once said, just show up. So there was a call uh, here in Vancouver, and uh, it was um, a, a group of um, curators were coming from the Humboldt Forum in Berlin, and there were, was a call out to artists uh, to, to meet with them. And um, I called up my nephew and I said, Chris, who, who's an animator here in Vancouver, let's go. And so we went out to UBC and we went into the room and I sort of expected a fair showing of people. We were the only ones that showed up. So I think that was, you know, essential. Yeah. You've got to show up. <laughs> and so um, uh, we continued our conversation and they were very interested in, in the sort of graphic novel approach, the Haida Manga approach to storytelling. So they commissioned a mural. Now that book, Jaj, over there, if you look inside the cover, uh, the paper cover, uh, the whole mural is depicted there. And it's, uh, I think it's two meters high and four meters long. Yeah, and I, I, if you open yeah. it, you'll, you'll see you actually go through progressively showing how it becomes a, a mural. And it actually, it's interesting too, because once I knew that, looking at the book, you can sense that form in each of the pages, that, that there's a lot of symmetry and a lot of thought goes into it. Yeah. How, how did your, your work is Haida Manga. What is it about telling a story in this way that appeals to you? Well, I've always liked to doodle. It's just, you know, part of who I am. I've got a couple of old friends here in the audience that will know that from 30, 40 years ago, of just incessantly drawing. And um, uh, so I needed to find an outlet. And when I looked at the work that we were doing in Masset, particularly the, the sort of classic form, I can remember conversations with some of my colleagues as a much younger guy saying, that, that's like comic books. And their initial response was, 
that's not like comic books. So then it was this challenge because then I felt, well, maybe I've got it wrong. So I had to sort of calibrate or figure out a, 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 a recipe, I suppose, to take uh, graphic literature that we're familiar with, and we just use the word comics, comic books, um, and insert that into this whole iconography, which is very classic, very traditional, very rigid, you know, has rules. Notwithstanding the rules and the rigidity of it, there is this amazing opportunity to create within that alphabet. And I, I really feel the need to do work that transcends those cleavages, um, you know, the specialized language and, 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 and all the sort of the idioms that are unique to small groups of people that isolate us from the rest. And at this point in, in my life, uh, and perhaps I, I would say collectively, um, as a species perhaps, yeah, I'll go that far, is we've got to figure out how to get together here. There's a whole lot of falling apart and, and, and pulling away, and in that midst of that madness, there needs to be some rationality. And, and for me, that is, we are all one species, there is no one in this room or on this planet who can say, I am pure anything. We're all hybrid, we're all diverse, and some or other, I think we need to, to acknowledge that. And one of the ways to do that is to break the language down, to break, to break the barriers down. Instead of it being a, a, you know, a solid wall, we have to perforate it. We have to make ways for people to move in and out without judging what it is Right. you know, that, that point of transition. It gives you a bit of a language to start from and then to move into different places with, right? It gives people a, a place to, a way to, a, a way able to uh, um, an ability to find their place and then move into somewhere else. Yeah, in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a welcoming way, um, in an emotional way, in a, in a positive way that isn't uh, repelling or we're not using it to sort of establish authority or power over over the other um, that, you know there's too much dispossession going on anyways and and uh, I, I think dispossession leads to well put a political s uh, slant on it to fascism right if the power and the privilege accumulates too far in one corner of the room <clears throat> the rest of us feel unloved and if we don't feel loved we kind of get a little bit crazy excuse me <clears throat> there's some water how do you, I guess, how do you navigate that inevitable, or did you want to finish that thought? Or? It's gone. Oh, okay, that's okay. We, we have many more thoughts to share. How do you navigate that uh, hybridity and that, that sense of change and still honor the past and traditions? So my great-grandfather, Alfred Adams, was a... Um, Quite an interesting fellow. He lived around the, you know, in the early 1900s. He was quite active politically. Um, founded the Native Brotherhood of BC. So he, I think I've got this right. So he spoke Haida, Tsimtsian, Tlingit, uh, English. I could read Greek and Latin. Now this is just, you know, 1900s. In, in Masset, and his daughter Julia, who's now gone, said one day she burst into his room to complain about something which was, you know, not something that was generally permitted. He was sitting in the middle of the room. First of all, all the walls were books, but he was sitting in the middle room on the floor in a full lotus position. So I think it's kind of important to understand that, you know, the 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 things that we learn today are not necessarily new. They've been around for a long time. And, and uh, as we get away from these historical figures, we start to paint them in, in ways that are comfortable and reaffirm the center of the universe, which we all think that we are. And, and we think, you know, privileged and specialty and, and the specialized knowledge and uh, unique accomplishments. But that's not true. We're just, we're recycling stuff. So I just want to say that uh, language and complexity and diversity was here a long time ago. So for me, when I go back and look at that, 
um, we've heard people talk use the word tradition, and I, I agree with the word, but I talk about the tradition of innovation, which is in the living moment. We're constantly taking things and, and trying to figure out how to fit them into our lives. They're old tools that we're applying to the situation in front of us. And in that way, we're honest to the tradition, not only of Alfred Adams, but of anyone in this room, to the struggles and challenges that you're grandparents, great-grandparents had. For those of you from Europe, as you'll see in this book, Josh, the, the question I ask is, why did so many Germans come here um, in such a short period? Why did so many Europeans come here? Well, it wasn't because it was such a wonderful world over there. It was harsh times, right? The power was, the privilege was with the landowners and the elite, and if you were just a poor farmer, you probably didn't own your land. And, um, I think I'm wandering way yes. off the question, but I'm saying we're more similar than mm. than than different from one another. And this this book travels through time and dimensions, and you you as I say incorporate uh, history, colonial history, but also your family history. There's a lot of research that's gone into this book. How did you conduct the research? Well, I got I got smart, you know, um, smarter. I was clumsy in the first couple of books. I'm trying to do everything myself. And it was at this point when I realized that I was telling someone else's story, uh, that the Humboldt Forum had asked me to write a story about this person who I didn't know, about historical events that I was not very familiar with. I realized I needed to take it seriously. When telling someone else's story, you better try and get the facts together. It's certainly helpful. Um, so uh, I think over the course, and it will say in the back of the book, I think we've had four, maybe even five researchers at various times. Uh, um, over at Victoria in the archives, that was a really good source of information. Uh, I've actually connected with Jacobson's family. Jacobson has relatives in Bella Coola because his brother stayed, fell in love, stayed, and, and there are uh, Norwegian descendants there. I didn't get to meet with those people there. But there was a lot of information around, and it was, rather than trying to uh, pretend that I was a researcher, uh, I just went to people who actually know their business. In terms of interpreting some of that research, though, I mean, you're, you're looking at some of the history that's written in a particular lens and then reinterpreting it through your lens today. And I, I mean, I'm thinking of the, you talk about names like Burnaby and Helmikin and, and James Douglas all show up in there in, in, in context that perhaps we don't think of them uh, in the history that has been written previously. So, um, Tom Swanky, if, you don't, if you're interested in some history, I would, I would track down Tom Swanky's books. Uh, he is a trained lawyer. I think he's probably retired now. Uh, Self-publishing which is, well, I always think that's not really the, the best strategy for moving ahead. But talking to some of the uh, publishing people in the publishing community, there was a resistance to publishing Tom Swanky's books because he's pulling down some of the bronze statues that we've put up. And he's doing it based on good research. I talked to a, a, a retired but preeminent BC historian and he said, yes, Tom has done the best research that's available to us. He's gone back to the written record. But the approach he took was, as a lawyer, he was sort of you know, interrogating the situation, interrogating the stories, and saying, well, that doesn't quite fit. But boy, that cer certainly fits together. So he, he presents his case. And it's a good case. And it does raise some real serious questions about some of the people here. Um, that we've named cities and streets after, as you said, uh, Pemberton, um, uh, Robert Burnaby, um, um, my grandfather, who my other grandfather, who was a Mason, would not appreciate me saying this, but Robert Burnaby was a high-ranking Mason and well-connected to some of the other lads in that same group who were the power in Victoria. And he wanted to, uh, as everyone did, figure out how we were going to get a road to the coast and he put his money on the Bellicula Valley and uh, hired um, Francis Poole and some of the lads who were um, uh, carrying smallpox 
and sent them up the valley with tremendous uh, loss of life. And uh, uh, I think the, and I'm not this sure about this part, but I think the Quinell hangings uh, of the indigenous civil servants that were hung in Quinell is actually linked to that same event. Anyway, so, but I'm not the guy there. If you want that story, you've mm -hmm. got to go to Swanky's research. It's good research. And I think, you know, I'm, I'm not interested in sort of running around s pushing over bronze statues. I, that's, but I'm just thinking we need to have a, a little more of an honest take on, on where we've come from so we know who we are here. Um, it's like the story I'm talking about, Alfred. You would think that a Haida person in a small community um, over a century ago might know Haida and sp speak a bit of Chinook or broken English. And as we know, this Alfred was a very learned man. He was not a, a unique person. Um, so I'm just saying, let's not just assume all these things that fit well into our history, but be prepared to think critically and, and therefore take responsibility for how we express ourselves today based on using our heads. You also begin the book with the naming of Masset, which is mm. symbolic of a, uh, another part of history. Yeah, oh, I like that one. You know, so Masset is a Spanish name. It's a Spanish family name. And I just imagine that when these lads, before the English came, when the ship was floating out off Masset, uh, which was then, well, I'll just say there's about seven communities there, we'll just say at Iowas, from the town of at Iowas. They saw this vessel out there, and they went out there and pulled the vessel in and helped. This ship was much injured, injured. masts were broken, and, and um, people had been injured. And they pulled them in to Masset Inlet, right across from the community of New Masset. There's a little island there. And they helped them repair the ship. They went into the forest. They harvested spars. They went together. They got it all patched up. And, and uh, you know, they were all enjoying each other. And the love or the affection between the, the people, the Haidas there and the Spanish sailors resulted in this uh, Spaniard, uh, I think probably one of the officers, giving his name because he understood the importance of names. And he gave his name, Masset to the community, and the community sort of, this is very lovely, you know, and they've treasured it. Uh, how, what a wonderful start. What a, what a great way to begin a relationship. And then, damn it, the British came, and they just buggered everything up, you know, they just, not to say that if the Spanish had lingered, they might have, you know, we, we know what the Spanish were up to as well, but. It's interesting to start in that place and then move through yeah. the bits of history and the chapters in history that you do go through. And, and you also follow the story of your, your great great grandparents, uh, great, George. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and other there's well, a, and yeah, other people. Yeah, in the book. Right. Um, yes. So I've I've merged things together. Now there's. The, so I have Josh Adrian Jacobson meeting George Harris. I don't actually know if that really happened, but I do know they were in the same place at the same time and that they were both mariners. And George is your ancestor. George, yes, yes, George is, um, so Alfred, let's just use Alfred. Alfred married my great-grandmother. So George is Alfred's father-in-law who disappeared in early April in, uh, 1892 uh, just off the coast of uh, Korea. And that's a whole nother story about George. You probably got another book. Yeah. You know, we <laughs> like to think our, our ancestors are all these, you know, upstanding, morally, you know, right on people. And I'm sure George was, but he fell in love with a woman in Japan and faked his disappearance at sea so he didn't have to come back to his wife, Julia, and he abandoned the five-year-old daughter, and he's a bit of an asshole, you know? But I'm sure that's never happened before. So, <laughs> so anyway, so George is out there. We've got family out there, I suppose, but George is in the story. But for Haida's, we trace our property transfer of generations lineage through uh, our mothers. And in that story... Uh, there's reference to uh, an event in 1862 when um, two young girls were 
whisked off the beach, uh, uh, probably only a few hundred meters away from the, the camp where this particular family, my relatives, were moving uh, towards Masset from the west coast, and they didn't know that smallpox had come to the camp. Uh, the uncles coming by in the canoe knew that, and they also saw that these two girls were not in the camp, so they called the girls, uh, they were uncles, they called their nieces, come on, get in the canoe, and they did, and the, the people in the camp didn't know what was going on um, uh, in, in, the, in the, the historical truth is that everybody in the camp died from smallpox. Um, Except the two girls. The two girls were whisked away. Um, so I, I needed to put that in there because that is the personal link I have to the activities of Robert Burnaby and James Douglas and Dr. Helmkin. And, and all the, 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 the lads in Victoria at the time when they used smallpox to eradicate. And they targeted Haidas and Newhawk and Tlingit and I think Tultan people. And the reason for that was because of the military force that we had and the self-governance structure. We, just because some guy said he's representative of the Queen didn't really mean a whole lot. And so uh, Douglas, frustrated after 15 years of trying to, you know, plant the flag and you know make his place as a governor of a colony, uh, apparently, seemingly, just sort of stepped back and gave up and let uh, Dr. Helmkin uh, uh, help spread the smallpox in, um, in particularly Victoria. I always like throwing this in there because I think it's important that of all the people in Victoria at that time in 1862 the only people on the record who protested the British use of smallpox were Jewish merchants. Now what's happening in 1862 is Jews are being murdered in Europe. And I always think, what force of character does it take that when you're being attacked that you can stand up and speak in support of somebody else? You know, I really think that was a, a kind of a wonderful thing. And that plays a role in this book as well. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting to see the book in all the different panels and knowing that you started it as this larger piece and then it's uh, a book that you read in order, but you managed to weave in so many different threads of history uh, in just a small space and, and it takes you, allows you to go off to different places if you want to. Yeah, the, the, there's a challenge. Now, again, like I was saying, uh, the original mural is is uh, eight square meters in size, so it's, it's quite quite vast, and you stand in front of it. I mean, I've spent a couple of years working on that panel, and I stand in front of it, and I cannot read left to right, top to bottom, and go through, because the, the graphic images are so powerful that my eye gets pulled over here. And, um, and uh, so there's, a, there's this, I, th I think the, the show at the O'Dane, we, we, were, we were talking about that earlier too, it's the same thing where you, you can twist the scale so much that you can't follow the narrative. And for me, what that, what that is, is if we sit here and look at a situation far away at a particular scale, we see it in one way. As we get closer to it, the situation becomes more intimate, we become more informed, and we can change our minds. Yeah, I, re I read the book when it first came out, and then I yep. read it again this afternoon, and it had a, you know, I got different things out of e each time. Mm. Some of the same things as well, but it's still, it's a changing, it changes the more times you read it. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's really, um, I think if you read the book, there's three lenses you can apply. Imagine you're looking at something through a telescope, binoculars, or a microscope, and, and that was the, that's, the sort of thing I was trying to do was to create that confusion. Um, I think it's working. Yeah, I, I would agree. Okay. Now, now, the concept of law plays a big role in this book as well. I, the, the colonizers come up against indigenous law, and uh, there's a quote which I uh, shared on with you when we had the first interview, but it still stands with me now. So it's, life does best when it is carried carefully and gently on our ever-shifting currents. A little disrespect is never just a little. Is more and business is never just business. Yep, I think it's true. <laughs> I just, uh, 
you know, pause there and think as a younger person, all the regrets I have about those times when I was arrogantly disrespectful and seemingly in an insignificant way, but it's never insignificant. Like, um, I won't, I'm not going to listen now. We would be here for days. But I think for all of us, there's these moments where we think, oh, you know, I could have done better there. I could have just, I could have smiled at that person. I could open the door. I mean, these little insignificant things, they're really critical because they, they cement relationships between us. They say, I see you, and, and you see me. And, and, and I think it's really important, particularly as so much of our lives are being pulled away into screens, you know, the devices and stuff like that, that it's actually starting to erode those really important relationships that keep us human and civilized. Mm -hmm. And there's the interpersonal relationships, but you also t talk about the laws in terms of the balance and a way of looking at the world that were disrespected um, when when things began to change, and, and that really puts the world in out of balance. Yeah. So from a Haida point of view, your um, let me see if I can say okay. So let's let's do a European point of view because we're all really familiar with that. You have sort of structure at the top, um, where basically we have um, given onto those institutions or those people uh, our sovereignty. Um, we have permitted our governments to exercise violence on our behalf. Uh, you know, we, we've given them everything. We, we have the power up there, and we are subject to that power. And thank goodness we have a system, a democracy system, where you can sort of do a checks and balance from time to time. But basically, um, it's, it's a, it's, I, I think of it as a fairly aggressive structure. In a Haida structure, to illustrate the difference, the highest ranking position that a man can take in a community is to be called a mother. Alonas Ao, it means the village mother. And the obligations of that role is not to exercise violence on behalf of the group, but to feed and nourish the group, to love your citizens like they were your own children. And so I think there's a, you know, a, a, an oppositional sort of way of looking at the way that the world is structured. The hideaway, and I would, I'll expand and just say I think it's kind of a quality that's quite common on this part of the coast, is it's more of a humble approach to life. It's not like, I'm in charge, I understand how it works. It's, it's, it's more feminine, if I can say it that way. It's, it's just gentler. It's not so aggressive. And, um, and the laws uh, around uh, that kind of attitude are far less complex than these very uh, complex systems where you're, you're managing your, your um, you're managing your citizens, you're telling your citizens, you're demanding, you're, you're directing, you know, you're controlling. You've, it's, it's a complex system. I don't... Well, I'm just pausing because I'm, I'm trying to think in terms of scale. If the Haida system is more akin to uh, locality and familiarity, and I paused because I was wondering, can you take that and apply that at, at the scale that we're dealing with when we're talking about 33 million people? I'm not entirely sure. Mm. Like, I'm not, I'm not here advocating, oh, let's all do the Haida thing and then everything's going to be perfect. But there is an alternative structure up there. And, and the way that it, it works uh, quite well in many important uh, respects is consensus minus one. And that is... Every, well, I think it's pretty clear the words, but it's not just consensus where everyone gets to agree and if you don't have agreement, you can't go ahead. It's to acknowledge that you can disagree with something but still permit it to go ahead. Um, and the consensus minus one approach is used in a number of models at home in Haida Gwaii. Mm. The relationships between indigenous peoples and settlers. Um, the care, okay, well, here's a good way to, to see it. If on... In Haida Gwaii, the fanciest house on the island is not that much different than the poorest bungalow on the island. If you come to Vancouver and you look at the biggest and best house, right, and you go down to the other end of the scale, the difference is huge, it's tremendous. Um, 
And I think that what I was saying earlier about if somebody's got all the power and the money in the corner, the rest of us feel unloved. And I think that's really dangerous. Super, super dangerous. At home in Haida Gwaii, it's, you know, there's a few dollars around, but you know, it's not like anybody is, is extremely rich or extremely poor. And then on top of that, this layer of mothering the people uh, tr trickles down to relationships between households. I think, I think I, I feel confident in saying that that's common to indigenous communities on the West Coast, in my experience, is this um, compassion. Friend, inherent friendliness, even if we're fighting like hell and arguing and spitting at each other, uh, the situation requires support. The sp support is there. How, how do we bring that into the larger world, or can we? Well, I think so. So in, in many parts of the world, people are shooting at each other, they're killing each other, they're doing terrible things to one another and over a wide range of issues. We have similar issues here in Canada. You know, we have the dispossession of land, the assault, I'll use the indigenous uh, situation. Um, uh, you know, every quality of being indigenous in Canada has been attacked persistently and violently. Everything, every notion of identity has been assaulted. Um, uh, so, you know, there's a, there's a lot of room there for revenge and retribution and, you know, and guilt and, and, you know, and stuff. And we're trying to deal with that, which is a wonderful thing, I would say, in defense of the prime minister is uh, to what degree it's been successful. I'm not sure, but to even acknowledge that there is a need to reconcile is, is a critical growing up moment. It's a, it's a, it's a big opportunity for us. Now, Aboriginal title and rights... Uh, as recognized in the Canadian Constitution, now touches on every facet of Canada. It, it, just as much as every characteristic of indigeneity is being attacked, Aboriginal title and, and rights leans on every element of Canadian identity. There is no part of, I would say, there is no part of Canada uh, that is not impacted. And I'm not just talking about geography, I'm talking about laws, I'm talking about policies, I'm talking about parking tickets in the streets in Vancouver. Everything, because it's, it's, at the, it's at the foundation identity of this country. The Constitution, the rule of law, is the foundation that we build our lives on top of. And I don't care if it's the Vancouver City Council, or the federal government, or the provincial government, or, or you know, any structure, has to honor the Constitution. That's the deal we made. And I don't think the deal is being followed. Okay. so. What if instead of being like other people in the world, shooting and being miserable, you know, fill in the word there, in fighting and violence, what if we actually decided that we were going to take Aboriginal title and rights and reconfigure the relationship and actually make our laws uh, uh, consistent with the Constitution? There was one old guy, I think I've said this to you before, but there was one old guy who went off in the Lancaster bomber uh, from Haida Gwaii in the Second World War and came back. He was a navigator, un, unscarred physically. Uh, he got home the day he arrived back in Vancouver, got hit by a car, lost both his legs, and spent the rest of his life in a wheelchair. Well, he was a thinker, and he said once that the what we called the land question then the settlement of the land question would be, and he was talking to loggers, I think. He was saying that the settlement of the land question would mean that they didn't have to pay mortgages. What does that mean? That means that every citizen should have a right to a home. And we're not going to get that in this existing system. We know that. Look at the news. We do not have it. Aboriginal title and rights allows us to go right down to the very bottoms of the the. the the, the inner workings of the machine called Canada and reconfigure it so that everybody does have the right to a home. We're not going to do it any other way because the, the, the feudal structure that we've inherited and, and gussied up and, and have as a parliamentary democracy would not allow that. You need to go way down deep and the only thing down deep is, is Aboriginal title and rights. Now you actually have 
more than 20 years of political experience on the Council of the Haida Nation. Uh, you draw on that as a speaker. You're, you're not just a, not just a, but you are also, besides an artist, you're also a speaker and um, a community builder. How does this connect to your work as an artist? So, I used to be, a, I used to work in the forest industry as a surveyor and uh, I, um, I had my revelation when I walked into an area that I had laid out, surveyed, here's where the road goes, here's where we'll cut the trees. And when I went back to it and all the trees were gone, and oh my God, you know, uh, the sense of what I did to that landscape that I had lived in for about four months was, that was my, that was my moment, that was, you know, um, my realization that I had to get out because this was going to drive me crazy. And so I then moved into uh, returning back to the community and working in the community. And part of the things we did in 1985 was the road blockades on, on, uh, in, in uh, what was then called South Moresby. And, uh, you know, we were blockading guys like uh, Tom Waterland, who was a minister of forests, who was also a shareholder in the same logging company that we were standing up against, and Stephen Rogers, Stephen knows that, and uh, uh, other members of cabinet were on a committee called uh, Environmental Land Use Committee, and they would approve the permits for the logging companies. And Jack Webster, too, they were all shareholders. Mm -hmm. and, but they, they weren't telling. So that's who we were fighting with, and we didn't really know that at the time, but you know, the information started coming forward. So we're, we're a bunch of, quotes, undereducated, uh, unimportant uh, Indians uh, and, and small group of, of allies fighting the biggest guys in, 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 in British Columbia. And it was uh, nervous. I was nervous, you know. Was, uh, um, the first people in the world outside the community that supported us was a village council in a community called Port Clements. And I don't know if there was even a Haida living in Port Clements at the time, but I do know that the mayor of that town was a divisional engineer for Mac and Blow, and that most of the councillors on that, on that council were, were employed in the logging industry. And yet they were the first people that came out and said, what the Haidas are doing with the blockade is right, it's proper. You know, that, that doesn't quite, you know, that doesn't fit into the game book. Right? They should be opposing because we're threatening their jobs, but they didn't. So, where, where do you did wanna, I was going to ask how you went from doing that to what you're doing now. Well, it was, I realized that the, the world was not just black and white. It was not this sort of Christian, um, you know, uh, good versus evil thing, right? Where, where it's like you're on one side or the other. Apologies to the Christians, but it's, it's handy to, to, to re refer to the situation that way. I saw, I realized it was complex. I was realized that someone who, is, who, who presumably is not a, a friend can be a very close friend. And so then that motivated me to take the designs and, and uh, the iconography that, that is Haida, classic Haida, and make it available to people who I would think, why would they be interested in this? Uh, they don't know us, you know, people from away. Um, so it, it, was, it was just kind of a growing up moment for me to realize that there was an audience out there that needed to know us better and we could trust that audience. What role do you think art plays in, in making connections and making change? Well, um, you know, art is, um, it, you know, we could sort of say it, you know, here's part of my life, it's this wee little box and it's art and then I do these other things in my life. But I think that actually art is just another word to describe who we are as a species. I mean, I think probably everybody in the room dressed yourself this morning. I mean, you know, you selected the colors, you selected the style, the fashion, you, 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 you curated yourself. And, and I think that we're all artists. And so um, I think art is a uh, is just a kind of a fundamental um, characteristic of who we are and, and what we do. Something funny happened. It's um, 
where we started to take art and, and sort of separate it. We, you know, we did funny things like there was a time when it was art, art was craft. Uh, uh, I, I think it was almost maybe, maybe there were some economic reasons for developing that specialty where you could say I'm an artist. Um, anyways, I'm wandering off. That's okay. You know That's what? Right? I was just thinking your socks. I don't know if people can see your socks. Oh. They're kind of a good example of that where it's uh, tell us about your socks, Michael, and then we'll open up the floor to some questions. Okay, we'll stop at the socks though. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So this is um, um, Hokusai's Great Wave, you know, the wave off Kanagawa. Beautiful. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm doing something called Haida Manga, and that's because of that connection through. Um, Japan as a place of refuge for indigenous people when it was really tough to be here with the, with the English. The, they were really nasty. Um, and Japan was really welcoming and had people in Masset coming back and just talking about how lovely it was to be in a place where you could just walk down the street, you could go in a restaurant, you go in a clothing store, you could, you could just be a human. And so I grew up with those stories. So Japan is and in Asia writ large has always had kind of a warmer place in, in our hearts and history for that, that time, which is why I do Haida manga. Anyways, so the Saddle Art Museum is, has a Hokusai exhibit coming up in October, and they asked if I would do a design uh, based on Hokusai's wave. So I've created something called the Lesser Wave off Kanagawa. And um, they liked it so much, they're making t-shirts out of it, so. And socks. Yeah. Although this might be a special edition. Right. Yeah. So, you know, underwear next, I guess. <laughs> I just thought it's a way of bringing, you know, you were talking about people getting dressed and separating the art mm -hmm. and collaborating and also I thought that was, just sort of brought a lot of things together. Yeah. Um, does anybody have any questions? Yes. So the question is, uh, the settler community is very diverse with many diverse opinions. How do we find a common base on which to connect and move forward in a good way? Well, well I think for starts, settlers should pay the rent. Um, a friend of mine from Musqueam, this was some years ago when we had many people fleeing Hong Kong and buying land here, and someone had asked him, well, what do you feel about this? And he said, well, at least they're paying for the land. And he was, um, so those are two things. We'll just let them hover in the air, and then I'll try and fill the space in between. Um, I think that the separation between that which is indigenous and that which is settler just speaks to the lack of substantial work that we've done on Aboriginal title and rights. As a Haida, I didn't dream up Aboriginal title and rights. You know, uh, my friend Larry from Muscombe, he didn't make it up. It's British law. It's Canadian law. It's incumbent on Canadian institutions and citizens to adhere to our law. And it could be your law, our law. Right? Um, so why the heck isn't anything being done about this? It's, you know, it's generations are living and dying and this piece of work is not being done. Why? I'll tell you why. Because many of us, most of us, particularly settlers, are benefiting from this situation. We're we're enjoying our homes. We're enjoying our life on stolen land. Stolen simply because, the, stolen by the definition of your own constitution. Now, 
you know, you, me, us, it's okay, but just to try and make the point. The Canadian Constitution requires a treaty to be made before the Crown can make any claim to that territory. And until citizens start demanding that governments at all levels start to adhere to the Constitution, we're going to have settlers and Indigenous people. And we're going to have this cleavage in between, which is going to allow all sorts of terrible things to continue to happen, as they are right now, today, tonight, right now. Right? People are suffering and dying and, and injured because we're not doing the business. We want to pull together as a people. The way to do it is to adhere to, to that, that, that work that needs to be done. I have, I have a Canadian passport, but I don't want someone to come along to me and say, you're a Canadian, any more than you want me to, to walk out there and, and say, you're this or you're that. Uh, I, I don't mind being invited in to be a Canadian. I want to join the party, but I'm not going to do it because somebody comes along and says you are a Canadian, you are subject to the, to the laws of the monarchy, you are subject to... That's, that's, that's not friendly. That's, that's not even nice in any way of the word, and yet that's how it works. And we are okay with that. We are okay with that because we haven't changed it. Do you, do you think any progress is being made? Does, does it, what gives you hope? Yeah, I, I think the progress, what I was saying about you know the blockades in 1985, and also more recently when uh, Haida Nation said to the federal government for years, particularly internationally, before UNDRIP, Canada, UN uh, Declaration of Rights of Indigenous People, Canada was persistent in Geneva in saying that will not apply to Canada because those people don't live here, that you're talking about, this uh, Indigenous peoples. And, and anyway, so um, the world has changed a lot since then. Um, uh, I, I'm, I'm hopeful that, that the situation is dramatically improved, uh, but there are still uh, uh, there is still too much resistance to it, 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 it in, in the sort of Mandarin and upper bureauc bureaucracy, I would say, and, and, and even the political masters. There is too much resistance to actually doing the work. And uh, you know, okay, so I, I will say that maybe of, of a hearty measure of Pollyanna and naivety, but I've been, for 27 years, I worked with, in that space between indigenous people and settler people, and I know what we can do, because we've demonstrated it, really progressive. So we went to Canada and said, or, or to, the, to the Supreme Court of Canada and said, Canada says, yes, there is Aboriginal title and rights, but you don't have it. You have to prove it. And so we went to the court and we said, okay, we're gonna prove it. And the court says, okay, what, what's everyone got to say about this? Canada said, oh no, you can't, you can't do that. BC, no, no, you, to, to, to raise the question will, will erode the entire structure. And a mayor of New Masson and a mayor of Port Clements wrote their position to the Supreme Court and they said, we trust the Haidas more than we trust the province. And the Supreme Court said, we're going to hear this case. So that was just two guys that both happened to be men, two small little communities that changed this whole thing. And then suddenly the federal government's going, holy shit, whoa, this is going to be scary, really scary. And, <laughs> and what's happened as a result of that is the type of negotiations that have taken place between the feds and the province and indigenous peoples, particularly Haida, I don't want to speak about my, my cousins and, and what they're doing, but has, it was really what we say, um, cleared the debris off the road. There was suddenly a serious intent to really talk about things and get, it, and get a lot of good work done. So that came down to two guys. I just want to make room for a couple more questions as well. Anybody, yeah?
I'll just repeat the question for the um, people who couldn't hear it and for the broadcast, which is more talking more about the connection between um, the Haida and, and the Japanese connection that you mentioned. Well, the older piece of evidence is the occasional appearance of the Mongolian blue spot um, on indigenous peoples along the side of the coast, that little blue spot that the babies have at the base of their spine, still pops up frequently. But more recently, and to, to the use of Haida manga, um, um, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't remember the precise year, but it, it's to do with the uh, pelagic fur seal hunt, um, when ships would actually uh, sail all the way from Victoria and raid right around uh, to Asia and up Japan, the Aleutian Islands, following the pelagic fur seal and hunting them for, for the their fur. Um, it was a big, big industry. And uh, the ships uh, soon discovered that, uh, that one of the most efficient ways of hunting the pelagic fur seal, and there was some uh, illegal treaty as well, but to the point they, they saw that uh, uh, sailors or mariners in this part of the world were very adept at being in small boats way out at sea and that they could actually take the rifle and, and kill a seal and, and still you know, bring the carcass back. So it was a big industry. So uh, lots of people would go sailing. Ships from Victoria, one, the mascot, for example, went up to Masset to pick up their crew of men and boats, and then they sailed to uh, Hawaii, and then from Hawaii they went over to uh, Japan and followed the first seal back. And I think it was like a six-month trip, and there was, you know, good money, and it was, so it was an, an economy. And when I was talking earlier about how nice it was for, for, for the great-grandfather and his brother, because those are specific stories I know, to walk through the streets of Hakodate in Hokkaido Island and feel like humans, it was referencing that. So it's not like I'm making a, a big, uh, not going back thousands of years or anything, although the blue spot is evidence of, of an older connection. This was... Um, yeah, so that's why. And I just wanted to appreciate that. Because when I grew up, like many of us, you know, a little closer to the end of the Second World War, J Japanese people were, Japanese people of Japanese descendants who were Canadian citizens were not respected here. And, 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 and I also was kind of wondering, because you'd hear these slurs and I'd, I'd see these sort of references that were very uncomfortable, and I thought, Hey, just a minute. These were the people that welcomed in my grandparents, great grandparents, made them feel comfortable, and and so that's. I wanted to speak to that and say I want to acknowledge that history, um, and I didn't want people to say, "Oh, this is a Haida comic book." Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Another question. Any other questions? Oh, yeah, there. The question is about in a world that becomes more and more mixed up and hybrid, where does that leave cultural appropriation? Yeah. So I'd like to um, tag cultural appropriation, just link it to this idea of Aboriginal title and rights. I'd like to also link it to the fact that most of the people in this room who are not of Indigenous ancestry can say, I have a homeland an ancestral homeland. I have a reference point somewhere in the planet. And for me, the reference point is right here. And that's why Aboriginal title and right is the anchor. OK, so I, I want to say it that way because I think that art essentially is not copyright as much as it is shareware. It's, it's, it's the sharing and, and the rifting off other people's expressions that, it, that get me excited and, and I like to do things. So. Uh, and I just want to tag it to the place because having said that, I didn't want everyone to go out there and do your own Haida manga and, you know, that would make me feel very awkward. But if we had Aboriginal title and rights settled, I wouldn't feel so terrible about that. If I had a homeland where my laws and culture was thriving and in charge of itself and respected as such, I would have less trouble with the notion of appropriation. So. The, the word that I use for a lot of the appropriation is, is mimicry, is cultural mimicry. 
And there's a caution here. And the caution is if every aspect of indigeneity has been uh, assaulted or taken, commoditized perhaps, um, one of the few things that might be left that hasn't been taken is, is art. Not like a hide a totem pole. There's a, there's a company here in town who are doing plastic totem poles. Well, I, I think for some of them, they probably made deals with artists, but I think for a lot of it, it's, that would be mimicry, that would be appropriation in a disrespectful way. Um, so, I've been asked to, to go to Berlin in, in, in about 10 days to do some work with in, some indigenous people and, and um, some scholars in Berlin about what is the relationship between institutions and indigenous peoples, or peoples who have attached uh, connections to cultural objects in, in, in the, the collection, if you will. And so there's a lot of thinking and having a lot of conversations with different people. And it's sort of starting to get to the point where not thinking about these as objects, but as envoys. Envoys? Envoys, envoys? Envoys? Yeah, does it work? Does it work both ways? Okay. As I say envoy, as but... <laughs> diplomatic opportunities. So that the issue of, I have an object that was acquired properly, i.e. purchased. Like when Jacobson came to Mass at, he wasn't. He he did a bit of looting along the way, I'm sure, but my great grandparents they're pretty smart people. We are producing cultural objects for sale. There's a marketplace out there, and we're selling it. So you know, so not everything is stolen, but there are some things that you know where we're not so sure about. Let's sit down and have a conversation. So my marching orders from home to go to Berlin is the first order of business is make friends. Once you have a friendly relationship, these big scary things that are banging around outside, they become small and they become manageable and we can figure it out. And, and so that's what we're doing. We've done that for years. We've done that with Pitt Rivers, American Museum of Natural History. It's just get along with people and be respectful. And then is it cultural appropriation? Is it stealing? Is it mimicry? Is it you know a transactional relationship? Whatever, these things kind of dissipate. But I would really think that I asked a couple of people um, who are engaged in mimicry why they were doing it. And the best answer, the only answer, most of them got very quiet and sort of took off, didn't want to talk to me anymore, was that they were doing it out of respect. And I thought that was bullshit, right? That's just taking again. It's just part of the whole history of you take your land, you take your kids, you take your language, you take your laws, you blah, 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 right? Oh, you got some artwork? Hey, I can make a buck out of that. You know, it's just the taking. And, and when it's that way, and when we be honest about it, I think it's, 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 a, it's, it's the bad side of appropriation. Something like that. It's just making this stuff up, you know. It's about... So building, I'm having a relationship, I guess, too, right? If you have I'm a sorry? it's also if you have a relationship with somebody, then you may not want to. You might think again about mimicry, or taking it. Yeah, and and, then and, it, and, and just in terms of, of of objects and institutions, we don't necessarily want it back. I don't want to go over to Berlin with, you know, a semi trailer and put everything in it and bring it home. That's 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 not what it's about. But anyways, this woman over here is being... Oh, yes. Hello. Yeah. Yeah.
Yeah. So just to paraphrase, it's an acknowledgement of a thank you for acknowledging the relationship between Japanese Canadians and Indigenous people. And then further to that, how do, even though UNDRIP is law, it is not being recognized in certain areas and beyond art and the power of art, how do you make change? There's a real simple hallelujah, solution to this problem of how we engineer change. This society we live in is much dependent on economy and monetary values and monies and um, uh, it's very clear after, you know, decades of being part of the negotiations that the federal government's position is, um, is very much attached to who has the purse strings and uh, that to them is the measure of, of power. So, if we're living here and paying taxes to the federal government, to provincial government, and municipal government, ultimately, uh, um, and decide that there's something terribly wrong with that, that the Constitution has not been lived up to, therefore the laws themselves are illegal, they're unconstitutional, then why the hell are you paying taxes to these guys? And if you started to say, as my friend uh, Anton over on um, Bowen Island has done, uh, he's given three thousand dollars to the to Squamish Band Council, I believe, saying, "Look, I know the situation is Im improper and disrespectful, and I want to show you that I, I see it. I'm not I'm not part of this. I mean, I'm 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 taking a position and I'm I'm putting money behind it and saying here." This is me, a citizen, standing up and making my alliance uh, quite clear. So I'm just wondering, what if there was a withholding of taxes? I think we have room for one quick question before we wrap things up. Does anyone have another question? Yeah. Mm, no, this, was that the question? Yeah. Okay, so, no, it's not, it's not perfect human society. It has tensions, it has uh, anger, it has pushback, it has disagreements, uh, uh, but the theory, the theory is a consensual agreement that none of our government structures have the right or power to compel us to do things like go to war. Uh, the the situation is uh, so. So I just want to be clear. You know, there's this theoretical, and and there's examples of it being applied, particularly between Haidas and Canadians, small uh, institutions at home where decisions are made by consensus, and that's expanded on the whole coast. There are these wonderful models of people working together. The reason why it's not being applied anywhere else in Canada was because the lawyers for the Ministry of Justice said that they would never allow this model to be applied anywhere else in Canada because it's predicated on saying, here's a Canadian view of the world, there's the Queen, uh, the King, the Parliament, and, and all this. And the other column on the paper says, and here's an indigenous view of the world. This is the sovereignty that we have. And the, mini the lawyers couldn't even tolerate the idea that you would recognize that there's a different cosmology of laws existing simultaneously with the British sovereignty. And that was the only thing that, that really blo blocked for many years uh, um, 
and still has blocked the application of this very interesting consensual model. Because how it works is you get the Canadian uh, side and you get the Haida side, and you, so you've outlined the differences, but across the page, there's a paragraph that goes across and says, Notwithstan notwithstanding the differences above, here's what we're gonna do together. So it just lets everyone sort of speak the truth, and it says, well, we may not agree, but here's what we're going to do together. It's quite a, you know, a loving kind of thing. And um, in that model, uh, um, the only reason why we were able to push, push this, pull this particular document uh, agreement through was Lucien Bouchard. Bouchard, who was a Quebecois, he understood what it was like to be a minority. He understood what it was like to feel unloved. And so when we went to negotiate with him, and this is so many years ago before, we spent most of our time talking about family. He had pictures of his kids. He didn't need to negotiate with us because he totally understood. He says, yeah, yeah, we'll sign it, just like that. Previous ministers in the federal government with the English background couldn't understand. It felt like, you know, if, I, think it, I think they felt like it was an insult to their identity. And it never was, and still isn't. So don't think that Haida Gwaii is this perfect place. It is a place with lots of tension. It's just a human place. But it aspires for something a little bit different than giving all the power and responsibility to someone else. J just because you vote once in a while doesn't mean you've cleaned yourself of responsibility for the way decisions are applied. Well, I think that we are going to wrap up now, Michael, but yeah. I want to actually wrap up where we started, and I want to ask you about the dedication, which you say is for all our friends, both known and unknown. Yeah. Two ways to look at it. So I sit in a studio, uh, do my work, and occasions like this are, are quite interesting to me because I get to connect with people who actually look at my work but my work is very private and personal, mostly. So friends, uh, as of yet, unknown, now, now known. So there's that part. But it's also a call for us to, 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 to accept the possibility that people are actually uh, inherently friendly at some point, that not everybody is, is a beast, is a monster out there uh, playing some sort of role in a Hollywood movie that there are more angels than devils in the world, uh, that, that we, can, we can smile to people, right? We can, we can be friendly to people. It doesn't mean we have to go up there and, you know, w totally absorb them into our lives. I'm not, let's not go all the way. I'm just saying we can be friendly to one another. And, and friendly is, is, is friends, and we can do that to strangers. There's no reason why we can't just smile at people. There's nothing wrong with that. I think most of us grew up in communities, well, those of us with whiter hair certainly were, the screens weren't filtering us out from other people. Excuse me, you know, making, making room for, for, uh, for someone else, for their physical presence, acknowledging that we see them. And, and it just reminds me, I'm gonna end on this one thing here. CBC did a, um, a contest years ago on what do you call a group of Canadians? You remember that? And you know, I thought it was really good, you know, because we have all sorts of, you know, names. We have a murder of crows. We have a herd of cows, right? What do you call a group of Canadians? It's a story of Canadians, uh, right? How do you get 100 Canadians out of the pool? I don't know. Get out of the pool. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, well... Okay, go, go home now. <laughs> Thank you so much, Michael. I think that that sentiment is a wonderful way to begin this journey in this book and a wonderful way to end this evening. And it's always a real honor and pleasure to speak with you. So thank you for sharing your, your thoughts today. Thanks, Margaret. Anytime. It's good. Thank you. And thank you to all of you for being here today and to Candy and Jorge for putting it together. Is that it? What's that? Oh, that's it. Oh, okay.